for sticking around and not hitting the beers too early. My name is Tyler Bell. I'm from Factual. Uh, Factual is a location data platform. I'm not here to tell you about Factual. What I was originally here to do was to tell you a little bit about uh, geocoding using OSM data, uh, but having uh, enjoyed uh, Eric's talk, Alex's talk, and Randy's talk, they basically scooped the entirety of what I was going to say, both in content and, and in means. Um, so uh, I've adjusted slightly on the fly. Uh, I hope that, that, that it's, it's still focused on geocoding, uh, but what I'm doing is bumping it up a level. I hope the, uh, the approach that I'm taking is no less entertaining or no less informative. Uh, it's nice to, uh, I certainly want to thank um, all the organizers uh, of this conference. Uh, it's a great bash. It's great to see so many new people is here as well. You can look around, you can identify the new attendees to state of the map because they're the ones with collars or, or of course, socks is, is, is the other giveaway. Right. Um, the, the, the curious title will, I hope, become uh, apparent shortly. So I have a story to tell. The story is about geocoding, but it begins and ends with two dead guys. Uh, the first fellow I want to tell you about is a chap named uh, Matthew Mari. Now, he did something very, very interesting, and this sets the context for my discussion, but it also acts as an exemplar for the way that I, and I think Factual, thinks about data holistically, uh, but also geodata more specifically. So this guy did something very, very interesting. Uh, he flourished in the middle of the 19th century. And, and he's well known as being uh, uh, applying data to the problems of, of uh, navigation. Um, and so if you wanted to get from point A to point B around 1850, uh, you would talk to the eldest captain in your uh, uh, coterie. And he would say, well, this is what I was taught and what my, you know, my senior captains were taught before me about how to get from A to B, about how to get from Barbados to London, for example. And it's never, of course, a straight line. It's always you go here because there's currents and wind, and you take a left, go up 40, 40 degrees, and then you accelerate. Now, it was all basically by word of mouth. What he started to do is he, he basically took the ocean and he divided it into uh, grid squares. Um, so basically grid squares of about five degrees each. Um, and he t asked all of the merchantmen, so he became head of instruments and books for the Navy. He asked everyone to apply, uh, whenever they sailed through one of these grid squares, they were to record uh, the month, uh, the temperature, the wind direction, and the wind speed. And so over a number of years, over 10 or 12 years, what he began to, to, to generate was actually uh, several raster overlays of the, uh, of the entire Atlantic Ocean. And so what he was doing actually was, was be beginning to build these data sets where every square had, had a vector. It basically had a direction and it had a velocity. So the GIS junkies in the audience obviously are just going bing because what this is is an anisotropic cost surface. And what happens is that he could actually use Using this mechanism, he could plot day, uh, month by month the best route from A to B with greater efficacy than anyone before him could. And of course, when you're cutting literally weeks off of any voyage, it means that profits go up. And so the Navy was totally jazzed about this, and the merchants heard about it. The merchants said, hey, we'd like in on this scheme because it's so terribly effective. And he said, I can, I, I can do that, but the exchange is, I will give you this master raster map. The exchange, though, is you have to do the same thing. You have to give me the data for all your voyages. And so, of course, the merchant marine was much larger than the naval marine. And it means that he actually got a boatload more data in, which improved the data for, of course, his merchantmen. So uh, the reason that I highlight this fellow is not only because it's, it's the first recorded instance of an anisotropic cost surface, obviously, but... <laughs> but also because the ethos that's expressed in this, uh, the, these arrangements are one uh, that focuses on the idea of data as non-zero sum. Your data and my data together are more powerful than they would be standing apart. Even though the data overlaps, together they're more powerful. So that's the introductory dead dude. <laughs> I'm talking about geocoding, obviously. Um, for any other audience, uh, this is obvious, you know, everybody loves geocode. Any other audience would tends to drop off, or I get an audience of 12. I'm related to six of them when you talk about geocoding. So thank you, everyone, for sticking around to hear about a bit more about geocoding today. 
I'm not going to talk about the particulars. I'm not going to talk about indexing or polygonal mechanisms or trying to close open polys. What I am going to talk about is what I believe are a new set of requirements that are coming down the pipe from people who need geocoding capabilities. So um, the first thing to point out <laughs> is, is everybody wants to do a geocoder, right? This is sort of like, oh, we've got OSM, all this data. I've got tons of things to geocode. I'm going to go make my own geocoder. And then they basically go into this black hole. They cross the event horizon, and they emit five years later as a burst of x-rays. And that's the last you've ever seen of your mapping colleague. At Factual, we put off doing a geocoder for about five years. It's something I didn't want to do at all. Uh, I'm still slightly tentative about doing that. There's, there's a lot of good ones out there, certainly. Uh, what we don't want is we don't want a proprietary mechanism where we have to pay per geocode. I'll still bite that bullet when I have to commercially, but fundamentally there is a need. Everybody still has this need for a geocoder. Uh, and um, you know, both Aaron and Seth, who are in the audience, have, you know, have talked, and I think I've actually written down what they've said, that it's absolutely insane that we're walking around we each have a large data sensor, data packet in our pocket, uh, which create data for us, but we're still paying just astronomical commercial fees for that information. And really, that in part is what my discussion is about today. So I'm presenting to you as the somewhat reluctant geocoder. Um, fundamentally, the aspects of open data, we all think of OSM, obviously, but I would argue that GPS is the most successful uh, open data initiative ever. Um, you get a lot of folks, especially VCs, like, oh, tell me about open data. And, and uh, you know, I hear it's coming down the pipe. And I say, well, actually, you've been using it since, what was it, 1986 or 1989 that, that GPS came to fruition. Uh, 2000, they turned selective avail availability off, which means that now everybody has access to data. So from that date in 2000, when they turn off selective availability, selective availability, for those of you who are wearing collars, is the idea that the government would uh, inject noise into your signal. And so you're using your GPS, and you might be 30 meters that way or 10 meters that way. Oh, we're in the US, so it's yards, obviously. Um, uh, and w which is just outrageous, right? We're all desperate for precision. The whole idea of inserting noise like that is anathema to everybody in this audience. But that's what they did until 2000. When they switched that off, we can actually now get interesting, uh, very uh, highly accurate location data. And I, I use accuracy very careful here compared to precision, because if you've ever worked with GEO and in the advertising agency, they're chucking you high precision six decimal uh, coordinate pairs down the pipe and say, ah, precise data. And you're saying, yes, but it's kilometers off, so it's absolutely not accurate. So that's always a good lesson in, in accuracy versus precision pedantry if you ever need a specific use case. But the, here's the thing about GPS. And the real, whole reason I have this up now is not, I'm not here to bang a drum that we all bang together together, which is that open data is successful, will succeed, uh, and is fundamentally a belief system as well as it is a data product. But what this means is with the GPS, our phones became mechanisms that don't just cr consume data, they actually create it. And I, as a product manager, and many of you whom I know in the audience now as product designers, are very much focused on accelerating that circle from capture to creation. And that's what geocoders help with. And I'll t talk um, a little bit about that now. So uh, there's, I, I'm coming at this with, I said, sort of a creed, sort of an, sort of an ethos. And so this is my upfront stance. Uh, the world requires uh, many open geocoders. Uh, I'm not here to suggest that Factuals is the only one that you should use. I'd like to see as many out there as possible. I'd like to see them talking together. Uh, OSM is not great for geocoding. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. Eric has hit on a boatload. Randy hit on a boatload. You know, it's, it's mainly focused, OSM's about the streets, less so about the addresses, less so about the hierarchical relationships, and I'll talk about that shortly. Um, fun, uh, the critical part, and I guess this middle bullet is my most important, is that the geocoder use case has changed hugely since we all started doing this, say, 10, 15, or whatever years ago. And a big point, and, and I'm up here to you know, articulate these points, and, and it's certainly my worldview, and it, it probably won't be your worldview. World view. Um, uh, they can live together. 
uh, I dig that. So uh, I would argue that we're now looking for the, the most important thing to be developing is actually a reverse geocoder. And I'll talk a little bit more about why I believe that is more important than a forward geocoder. If you don't know the difference, you can just Google it really quickly. Um, and of course, to get there, we need to have open polys to give us that element of, cont of context. And we also have to have open addresses. Paying for postcodes, paying for addresses is, again, anathema to me. And I suspect it is to the, the bulk of attendees in this audience as well. So let's get on this idea that the geocoding use, use case has changed. It used to be all about maps and nav. Basically, you're translating from human speak into machine speak. And so you've got an address, and you need to turn that into a longitude and latitude. Machines love longitude and latitudes, humans less so. They're very difficult to read by themselves. What I'm arguing now is that uh, fundamentally the geocoding use case is less about converting addresses into points and much more now about actually converting points into context. We all have devices that are just throwing off data. Now it's throwing off longitude and latitude through our GPS, yes, but more importantly, all the other sensor information that you have is tied to a place. So if you think about it, oh, and I've got the wrong slide, bugger. All right, um, this point really was just to accentuate that the, uh, did you like the way I glossed over that so no one recognized that I got the wrong slide in the wrong place? Um, th this is really just to accentuate the idea that the, of, of mapping has changed. This was the logo for State of the Map back in, uh, back in 2007. Um, this is what it is today. So we've gone from a scale bar, which you just don't see anymore, to a, a, a satellite. So it's hyperbole, uh, but it makes my point conveniently enough, at least for this part. Ah, here we go. Good. Um, so every one of these sensors on your device, the accelerometer, gyroscope, uh, the Bluetooth, basically any kind of radio activity that's happening here, sorry, radio activity, so, so Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, cellular tower information, um, you've got uh, uh, ambient light, so-called proximity sensors, all of these things are, are creating data and everyone is going to be linked into that longitude and latitude that the GPS is throwing off as well. So I argue um, that this device that we all carry in our pocket, that of all those wonderful sensors, all the, 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 the holistic contextual data that it's grabbing, the key linchpin is the GPS, because everything ties into the GPS. And then you have this wonderful GPS position with a cloud of sensor information, which you can then put on a map. Then you do that a billion times, and you learn about how people engage with the world around them. So talking about forward and reverse geocoding, fundamentally what I'm here to talk about today and my belief is that we are now living in a world where we are not as human beings converting from addresses to points as much. We're actually converting from points into context. Less about the street address, much more about neighborhood, uh, much more about the environment. It's much more around who's around me. It could be the, the city, state, and zip, et cetera. Um, so we've created a, uh, a, a, re a reverse geocoder at Factual. It's only a reverse geocoder. We have no plans to make a forward geocoder. Uh, and we have a number of requirements. And I just wanted to lay these out quickly. I don't have time in the 20 minutes we have here to talk about each one. But I hope that, again, it, it provides some illustration and color to the way that we're thinking. So focusing on reverse only. Design for tagging. This is critical. So it's less about getting down. Uh, let me convert that point into address. That is, that's a minor, minority edge case. The use case that we see within the commercial market is everybody wants to tag something, and it's usually coming off of a mobile device. So how can I tag stuff? How can I tag billions of things with great efficiency at very low cost? I don't want to have to nickel and dime and think when I'm designing my product that it costs X fractions of a cent per geocode. And so the whole idea of geotagging is moving away from the thinking that, yes, I'm converting this point into address, and actually I'm converting this point into a number of fixed hierarchical levels. And if you want to think city, state, and zip, just as a convenient um, sort of moniker for that, that's fine. 
Um, it's going to be fast, so uh, most geocoders are fast, but if they're built on Postgres, they tend to slow down. So it's the whole reason Randy is one of the major regions I would, uh, I would suggest that, that Randy is going with Elasticsearch is that it's just made for speed. So when you're, when you're geocoding these things and you're geocoding them in batch and you're dealing with massive communities of the kind that we see today online, massive communer, uh, uh, consumer communities, uh, it needs to be able to just run these three things through day and night without pausing. On-premise is critical, so services are great, but we're seeing more and more requirements coming through where people say, this has to be on my infrastructure. I can no longer deal with the latency that requires me to make a REST API call onto your hosted service. So whatever you do, whatever you design, package the hosted service, but yes, Factual encapsulates that and then allows you to stick that on your, your own infrastructure as well. Number five, uniform hierarchy. This is a, a real bugbear because uh, the, the critical aspects of geotagging is that you want some kind of uniformity about understanding context. What you don't get in OSM is any kind of consistency across countries or in countries. So if you've ever tried to map place tags against admin levels, uh, basically it, 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 when you send away for the correspondence course and doing that mapping, it comes with a free straitjacket. And it's because everything's different and everybody re interpretates these things differently. Remember, when we're mapping entities, we're trying to map them by type and that type may not necessarily fit within a specific instance. The U.S. has places like that, like townships in, in Pennsylvania, the boroughs in New York City. If I hear Aaron say one more time about the frickin' boroughs in New York City and where on earth I I'm swearing I'm going to put a bull in your head. I, st <laughs> I, st I still get emails like this, all right? Just you feel a little bit grumpy and hey, Tyler, I've got a few, I've got a few problems with where on earth. <laughs> So remember, you're, you're mapping types, okay? So when you're actually saying, well, this entity, you're saying, yes, it's a city, but also fundamentally and programmatically, when you query a reverse geocoder, you don't want it to be the Forrest Gump uh, box of chocolates you, you get back. You need to know what is going to be returned. So you don't want to get different admin levels and go, oh, bugger, because people are creating global interfaces now. And whether that query is, is made into France or the US, or into the Vatican, you need to get a consistent response packet back. I've done a lot of talking, I see. Not enough, though. Um, unambiguous entities, it's not good enough anymore just to give a string. We actually have to give some kind of identifier back because there's far too many places named Springfield in the US. Global, naturally, I won't go into that. No touch, low touch. So many of these, these things require editorial. You've seen just Eric banging his head against this stuff overly. The idea that, fa that Factual is pursuing, we're not there yet. I say we're about 90% of the way there. The idea that we are pursuing is that, f that what we are aiming to do is create a system which is automated mapping, and then it grows and improves as OSM data improves. And then lastly, we're looking for address level granularity. It's not always required in a geotagging use case, but road intersections, addresses, importing Tiger, all that's very important as well. So that's the sort of specifics. Some of the problems, which I'm going to gloss over very quickly here, because because you've heard them already today. One is that the, the you know, problem with doing this mechanism is that the S in OSM is for streets. A lot of the check technical challenges we get is the dealing with the hierarchy normalization. What happens when you get a point that's not near a street? We still want to give some kind of idea of the county and the state and the zip, and therefore a street a street-focused data set doesn't allow that. You really need polys or some kind of mechanism to allow those inputs to hook into data, and you don't have them otherwise. Human expectations is a very interesting one that I wanted to highlight. This is LA. So obviously this caption to anyone from Northern California is self-evident, right? They put cilantro on everything. But, <laughs> but what I'm talking about specifically here is the shape of LA it makes absolutely no sense. Look at those donut holes. Look at that bendy thing coming down to the south there. This is what uh, LA looks like officially, okay? Big scare quotes around officially. When we ever deal with any of our clients or you talk to any man on the street, you say draw LA, it's not gonna look anything like this. There is a break between human perception and officialdom. And increasingly the geotagging use case demands human perception rather than the official poly. 
I'm not going to talk about the response packet because who wants to look at JSON at quarter to five on a Saturday? Um, the whole approach that I want to talk about here really, and I'm, I'm just wrapping up now, so um, uh, the whole goal that we want to do is we want to get everybody using OSM. Uh, obviously we want to get people using our geocoder and using our ancillary services, but by getting people to use OSM we can force examination of the ODBL. I don't have time to reiterate um, and support uh, what you've heard from our fellow speakers today, uh, but fundamentally a lot of people are, when I say people, I mean lawyers, corporations, organizations small and large, are reticent to engage with the ODBL, uh, what I'd like to see is more people doing that. And so I think a critical mass is building up, and when this, when this wave breaks over the wall of the ODBL, it's either going to force case law, where we actually get some kind of formal legal interpretations of the ODBL, or it will raise the comfort level. People say, actually, this is something that you can do and we can do, and I think that's a good thing. Again, that increases contributions to OSM, and then of course, go-to is considered harmful. <laughs> so to conclude, to, so to conclude, uh, coming back to the idea of the non-zero-sum data, we found a, a very uh, uh, interesting instance at Factual that I wanted to share with you. And we, tr at Factual, we, we create basically POI or commercial data. We want to give people data. We want them to correct it, improve it. We want them to share it back with us, and then we can keep sharing. So we position ourselves within the world of POI data as data stewards, rather than elbows out licensors that you're you're usually familiar with. Um, what we couldn't do is we contractually found it extremely difficult for anyone to agree to give data to us. Smaller companies were like, yeah, no problem. They didn't have the data. Bigger companies who had the data were like, wait, you know, that's going to take engineering and legal. Oh, I couldn't possibly think of engaging that way. And that's, that's still the case. You, it's very, very difficult to engage people to get them to contribute contractually. Instead, we said, hey, let's turn it on its head. Let's not do the stick. Let's use the carrot. And even, well, actually, we use the carrot contractually. So we'd say, we'll give you a 50% discount if you're chucking data back to us. People say, oh, I don't know, engineering. <laughs> so instead, what we said is, look, there's always the concern about data ownership. We will give you 25 million POI for you to use in your product. If you edit one of those attributes, and we, we get 14 attributes, if you make an edit to one and then share that edit back, then we both share ownership of the entire record. And that's what's actually getting traction now at Factual commercially with our customers, is that it's not being driven by cost, but it's actually the ownership and the IP issue. And people are comfortable now sharing data back because they know that that information is shared. And that really brings me to my last guy, a fellow named John Bunker, who you've, you've never seen in a mapping conference before. Because what he did, he's basically the, um, you can think of him as the oracle of apples. So what this dude did, or, uh, or yes, what he, what he did, he died last year, is that he would go to country fairs in, in uh, northwestern America, uh, U.S., northeastern U.S., and people would bring apples to him. Because there, there used to be thousands of varieties of apples in America, but now there's only a small handful. Those are the ones that you're familiar with in the shop, you know, the Golden Delicious and the, and, and the uh, Granny Smith, etc. There used to be absolute thousands of them. And his job was actually to, to, he would, not so much his job, but what he loved is that he could identify these things. Apple trees live for between one and 200 years. So even though they're commercially dead as a product, they are still viable. And people have these things growing this crooked, ugly old fruit in their backyard. And they take this to him and say, oh, what is this thing? And he'll identify the apple. And I really came to care for this fellow, reading the Mother Jones article about him, um, for two reasons. One is because what he says here, which is very much about the standing upon the shoulders of giants, but also about what he t taught me about apples, which is that apples are not uh, propagated by um, uh, pollination and apple seeds. But if you want to get consistent apples, if, if you want to grow your orchard, I give you a clone, I give you a, a part of my tree. Then your tree grows up, my tree grows up, and we can exchange and keep cloning each other to grow our orchards together. And I thought this a very uh, satisfactory and conclusive metaphor for the idea of the non-zero sum data, where by sharing this, we both, sharing the data, sharing the information, uh, both of our crops are enriched. And uh, that's me done. Thank you.